Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us today. Honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the former federations, I'm delighted to welcome you all for the launch of our marquee report on gender dynamics and federal and decentralized governance. Some of you have received this in, in electronic format, and in due course, we will have a hard copy going out. We're very fortunate to be joined today by two outstanding public figures who've agreed to share their own experiences of what it means to work at the intersection of gender empowerment and multi-level government. I'm talking, of course, of our distinguished panelists today, the Honorable Karina Gould and the Honorable Fitzum Asefa. Minister Gould, in her capacity as Minister for International Development, spearheads Canada's feminist international assistance policy and is globally recognized as a champion of gender equality. Minister Fitzum, uh, as Minister for National Planning and Development, is at the forefront of overseeing economic transformation and sustainable development in Ethiopia, one of Africa's largest countries, but also amongst its most vibrant economies. It should be noted that uh, Canada and Ethiopia were amongst the first countries in the world to put forward gender balanced cabinets at the federal level and remain in many in many aspects, leaders on, on, the, on the matter of gender equality. I also wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge some of the dignitaries who've joined us here today from, from various parts of the world. I start with our uh, attendees from Ethiopia, uh, the Honorable Ahmed Shede, uh, Minister from the Prime Minister's Office, the Honorable Estenge Mengistu, Deputy Speaker of the House of Federations, the Honorable Hiwat Hailu, Sta uh, chair of the Standing Committee on Intergovernment Relations from the House of Federations, the Honorable Filson Abdullahi, Minister for Women, Children and Youth Affairs, the Honorable Bittakun Ayondadi, State Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Siyum Messin, State Minister for the Ministry of Peace, the Honorable Lome Bedo, Speaker of the Oromia Regional Parliament, Honorable Ellen Debebe, Speaker of the Southern Regional Parliament, Honorable Warkesu Speaker of the Amara Regional Parliament. From Jordan, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Honorable Ali Al Kawande, uh, Secretary General for the Ministry of Political and Parliamentary Affairs, uh, Dr. Salma Nims, Secretary General of the Jordanian Commission for Women. From Pakistan, uh, uh, the Honorable Salim Mandiwala, Deputy Chairman of the Senate of Pakistan. And from Tunisia, uh, the Honorable Hasna Ben Slimane, Minister for Public Administration of the Republic of Tunisia. Thank you uh, for joining us from around the world. And I also want to extend uh, my thanks to all of us who are joining us uh, on the Zoom call, but also many more who are joining us through the live stream. This event is the first of several planned over the next year to mark 20 years of the Forum of Federations. It is indeed a fitting coincidence that 2020 also marks 20 years of the U UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which all of you know is a global commitment to ensuring that women and girls are more systematically integrated into peace and security. For us, this report by Dr. Christine Foster represents a significant step forward in trying to systematically understand how our work in supporting the construction of decentralized and federal systems can advance the cause of gender equality by bringing more women into the public policy and political arenas. Since its founding by Canada in 2000, the forum has benefited from the support of nine other member governments, including Australia, Brazil, Ethiopia, Germany, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Switzerland. In addition to this, we've had the benefit of support from other countries such as the Netherlands, the Irish Republic, Denmark, the United Kingdom, and Norway. Over the last 20 years, this has allowed us to work in close to 40 countries supporting reform, democratization, both in the established federations, but also in countries that are democratizing, federalizing, or decentralizing, including several that are trying to rebuild after many years of conflict, where federalism, decentralization, devolution is the possible glue that might bring these countries back together. While the forum was originally mandated to share experiences between established federations, over the 20 years of our existence, it has become increasingly clear to us that the uh, that governance around, uh, arrangements that exist in the world outside 
are not binary. The world is not made up of federal and unitary states. Rather, it is a continuum where most countries fall somewhere in the middle. More to the point, experience shows us that in recent years, uh, good governance and democratization has impelled many countries around the world to move in the direction of, of establishing constitutionally recognized regional and local governments as a way of putting in place governance structures that are resilient and responsive to local needs. And in the process have created political processes and administrative processes, which we in federations would recognize as being uh, close to the federal idea. I mean, federalism is not, uh, not an ideology and we are certainly not proponents or advocates of, of federalism. But what this means is that many of the ideas or experiences that we have in federations uh, are more easily comparable to what is happening in many, many of these countries. Uh, so for us, this opened up opportunities for a greater sharing of experiences between federations and other types of multi-level systems. Consequently, the report that's being presented today uh, has findings that draw on the experiences, not just of the classical constitutional federations, but also of other countries with various types of multi-level systems of governance. Since 2011, our continued engagement in countries such as Myanmar, Jordan, Tunisia, and Yemen, supported by Canada, and our work in countries like Nepal, supported in turn by Germany, Switzerland, and the UK, have made it obvious to us that building sustainable multi-level democracy is only possible when women are part of public institutions at all level of governance, and when structural barriers to more gender equality in the economic sphere and the constitutional space are properly addressed uh, in these countries. Our work in many countries around the world has also made it clear to us that federalization and decentralization offer some unique opportunities for addressing gender equality, particularly because they open up additional pathways for women to participate and shape, pub, uh, and shape public policy. Indeed, one can make the argument that more women in cabinet, in parliament, as governors and as mayors is a prerequisite to gender sensitive policymaking, which in turn has direct impact on issues ranging from access to education, maternal health, economic independence, and ending violence against women and girls. As the UN women have recently highlighted, the ongoing COVID pandemic has and will continue to have a, uh, a disproportionate impact on marginalized communities, including on women and girls in particular. In the context of both the current crisis and the post-pandemic rebuild, governments must ensure that women and girls have access to services and opportunities on an equal basis with men. Subnational governments will play an important role in the rebuild that is likely to come after the pandemic. And in this sense, it's very important that women are integrated into multi-level systems so that they can shape policies in critical areas that impact the quality of lives for women. But the findings of the report also highlight the primary levers that exist within federal and decentralized governance. But it is also important to point out that federalism decentralization is not panacea and the, and, and the report recognizes that. Before I hand over the floor to Professor Foster to make uh, a presentation, I just wanted to thank you again uh, and particular thanks to our panelists for taking the time from their very busy schedule to join us this morning for this launch. Uh, I know that our panelists are slightly pressed for time. So what, what, we, so what, what I propose we will do is that uh, Dr. Foster will make a, make a presentation and then we can go in directly into a panel discussion. I know the two, two ministers with us have, have a statement that they would like to make uh, at the beginning of the discussion. And, and, and then uh, we will try and uh, wrap up uh, at about uh, 9.45, 9.50. Thank you very much. Dr. Foster is an eminent expert on gender and politics and is professor at the law school at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Uh, Christine, over to you. Thank you, Rupak. And first of all, I would also like to thank uh, Ministers Gould and Asifa for participating in the launch and convening to discuss this really important issue of gender equality and governance. I'd also really like to, to thank the forum and acknowledge the forum for prioritizing this really important issue. 
Although gender equality is a major concern for women globally in all governance systems, um, this particular report focused on federal and decentralized countries. Um, it looked at six thematic areas, uh, protection of rights, family relations, service delivery, political representation and participation, and economic empowerment. Um, and within those six areas, it identified federal advantages and federal disadvantages in the furthering of gender equality. So the report found that there is no one size fit, fits all solution um, that can encompass the complexity of federal architectures. And of course, that appropriate strategies for advancing and furthering gender equality have to be considered within the specific context of each country. Um, but it did find that there were advantages and opportunities that emerge from federal, federal arrangements of governance. So I'd just like to highlight a few of the key findings of the report. So first of all, federal countries provide multiple access points for the women's movement and their allies to lobby for reform measures. So the more decentralized the federal system, the more access points that are available. So what multiple access points mean is that if the central government is resistant to gender equality measures, women and their allies can focus on receptive subnational units to lobby for positive gains. So just to give an example, in the area of protection of rights, the report found some federal countries where domestic violence legislation had been successfully enacted in some progressive subnational units, even though other subnational units were resistant to such legislative changes. Another example in political representation and participation, the report found that federal systems increase opportunities for women's political representation and participation because there are more public office positions available. Um, also because of the close location of subnational units to community made it easier for women to participate in political public office. Um, and also because of reduced and more manageable costs to women candidates um, if they run for subnational public office and local positions. The report also found that federal systems could provide advantageous conditions that support the introduction of additional measures, for example, the introduction of gender quotas, which have been shown in lots of research that it is the most advantageous way to increase women's political representation. Um, and in federal systems, gender quotas were often introduced at subnational levels where they didn't provide such a challenge to power elites and so were more easily introduced. And then additionally, in examples of policy transfer, where gender quotas were introduced at the subnational level, they were then adopted by other subnational units when they saw how successful they were. A third example is that federal systems encourage innovation and experimentation in subnational units. And this can lead to positive gender equality initiatives. So just to give another example, um, in some countries, women run police stations were very innovative um, intro introductions that encouraged women to approach and report violence to police. Now these women run police stations were then subsequently adopted by other subnational units that saw how successful they were in reducing violence against women. Another important point that the report found was that new federal systems particularly offer opportunities for the advancement of gender equality reform because of institutional newness. And for example, in the area of rights protection, the report identified a number of newer federal countries that had incorporated extensive and positive rights protection for women in their national constitution. Now, older federal systems also offer similar opportunities when constitutions are revised. 
I do have to also say that there are disadvantages in federal systems or potential disadvantages for the advancement of gender equality. Um, for example, the fragmentation of the women's movement limits their capacity to organize and lobby for reform. Indeed, the report did identify also a number of inconsistencies in federal countries where women had different access to things like the provision of services, the protection of rights, protection against gender-based violence, the way in which the family was regulated, um, because each subnational unit, of course, had the ability to organize things according to their own standards and values and, and um, objectives. Now, other key findings, such as the significance of fiscal support, um, the advantages that can be created by subnational units being very close to community, especially, especially local governance, and also the very significant importance of men as allies are covered in more detail in the report. Um, and I'll leave that to you um, to look at the report yourselves and see all of these details. And finally, I just want to say that I hope that the report supports initiatives in federal and decentralized countries that will enable the important furthering of gender equality and the protection of women's rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine, for the presentation. Um, I've just noticed uh, that I uh, that uh, Speaker Adam Farah, the Speaker of the House of Federations, has joined us, so I'd like to welcome him uh, in addition to the other dignitaries that I mentioned previously. I think at this point we will go into our panel discussion uh, with uh, Minister Gould and uh, Minister Fitzel. Uh, again, thank you very much for taking time to join us. Uh, let me start by asking uh, Minister Gould uh, to comment a little bit about uh, uh, the experiences that you've had in government on promoting gender equality, both domestically, uh, regionally, as well as globally. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, Rupak, uh, let me just start by congratulating you and the forum for on your 20th anniversary. It's quite a, a milestone, and I'm so delighted to be here with all of you to do this and also not just to be celebrating the 20th anniversary, but to be talking about gender equality um, and governance and federalism. I think it's a, it's, it's a really wonderful uh, conversation to be starting off with. Um, I think when we think about, um, you know, it, advancing our understanding of the impact of federal and decentralized governments on gender equality, you know, we're, we're talking about equality much, much broader. Um, and, you know, the Forum of Federations is an important partner for Canada in support of governance, political participation, and peaceful pluralism. Its work is well aligned with the priorities of Canada's feminist international assistance policy, a policy that represented a significant and deliberate shift in our international assistance when it was launched in 2017. And this pivot recognized explicitly the root cause of poverty and instability is inequality. So therefore we seek to amplify the voices of the poorest and the most marginalized, especially women and girls in all their diversity. So we believe this is the most effective way to eliminate poverty, create lasting peace and achieve sustainable development. And we know that when gender-based legal and social barriers are eliminated, women can participate fully and meaningfully in, in public life. And then without a doubt, when women and girls have equal opportunities to succeed, they can be powerful agents of change. But the most persistent gender gaps exist in political participation. Barriers to meeting this fundamental condition of democratic governance continue to exist in every region of the world. That's why despite their low numbers, women political leaders at all levels play an important role in helping to break down the barriers that prevent women and girls from succeeding in all areas of life, not just in the political realm. So as role, model, role models, they help transform attitudes towards women in society and in the home, and their presence in government also leads to better decision making. A turning point in Canada's ability to implement this shift towards a feminist approach was the support of leadership from the top. When we see concrete action, it sets the importance of gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. So for example, in 2019, Prime Minister Trudeau appointed his second gender balanced cabinet in Canadian history, 
and renewed gender equality as a domestic and international priority. Canada adopted a comprehensive approach to integrating gender equality in all areas of G7 work during its G7 presidency in 2018. And under Canada's leadership, the G7 endorsed targeted initiatives to improve the lives of women and girls around the world with regard to sexual and gender-based violence, education, and humanitarian action. Another key pillar to our policy is inclusive governance. We support governance that better serves all citizens through respect for human rights. Governance that strengthens legal empowerment, encouraging greater participation in public life. And governance that makes sure public services work for everyone. Since 2015, Canada has supported projects that contribute to increasing the participation of women in municipal governance in Africa, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and the Americas. A cornerstone of our feminist approach to international assistance is working hand in hand with local women's organizations as they play a central role in spearheading change in support of the empowerment of women and girls and gender equality. Here's a recent illustration. In Ghana and Mozambique, women's networks were able to issue news releases and engage in dialogue with government officials to promote women's leadership and decision-making as part of the COVID-19 pandemic response. National female leadership has a positive impact on the COVID-19 response. We have made a lot of progress since 2017, but there's still a lot of work to do to achieve gender equality. We want to be able to say we did everything we could to recover from this global pandemic and move towards a more equitable world. So there's a lot to discuss and uh, I'm looking forward to carrying on the conversation. Thank you very much for your comments. I'll uh, move over to Mr. Fitzum. Uh, let me start by uh, saying I've just been informed that it's uh, Mr. Fitzum's birthday today. So Happy birthday to you, Minister. <laughs> Again, we're delighted you could join us uh, and, and make time on your birthday, more, moreover. Uh, so the same, the same question to you. Uh, we'd be very keen to know what, what you're doing to promote gender equality domestically, regionally, globally. Thank you so much, uh, Honor Honorable Minister Gould, uh, uh, Honorable Ministers, Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which part of the world uh, you are joining this important conversation. Let me begin by extending my heartfelt appreciation to the Forum of Federation for organizing uh, such important and timely conversation on the report entitled Gender Dynamics and Federal and Decentralized Governance. I'm also grateful for sharing this virtual stage with Honorable Karina Gold, Minister of International Development of the Government of Canada. As it's clearly discussed in Dr. Foster's research, all governance models, including the federal system presents their own challenges and opportunities in addressing gender equality. Any form of governance system has its own historical, social, and cultural dynamics, which impacts the path of progress for gender equality which means there is not a perfect model of governance system that fully and completely addresses the crucial issues of gender equality. While each country has its own context, the issue of gender equality, the struggle and the search for just society where the equality of girls and women is not an afterthought, but the main national agenda uh, is universal. As such, it's critical we share experiences, research findings, and support each other in our endeavors. My country, Ethiopia, has committed to standards for gender equality and women's human rights as a natural outcome of its own constitution and its national policy on women, which guarantee women's equality and the protection of women's human rights in various spheres of life. The family law and the penal court have been made more congruent with international and regional instruments. Ethiopia, as a member of the international community, has signed a number of agreements promoting and protecting the rights of women. It has ratified the Convention on the Political Rights of Women and the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Ethiopia has also adopted the, prim the principles of 1995 Beijing Platform for Action and has endorsed and engaged with the Sustainable Development Goals. Under the new leadership of the Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, 
it will embark on an ambitious reform process that supports and facilitates the promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment. Women have been appointed, as you uh, mentioned earlier, to key leadership positions, such as a cabinet with 50% of women ministers. We have the first woman head of state in the country's modern history. It also led to the appointment of the chairperson of the National Electoral Board and the appointment of the women's rights champion as a country's Supreme Court president. We are encouraged by the advances we made while we still have a long way to go. The system of federal governance in Ethiopia, like in any other federations, has both adverse and positive implications for promoting gender equality. One example of positive impacts of the federal system on gender equality is in increasing political representations and enhancing participation. The various levels of governance structures in the federal system have opened up space and have provided multiple access points for the participation of women. Women are increasingly getting represented in different positions of governance from local to regional and federal. On the other hand, the federal system limits and leads to the fragmentation of women's participation. Discriminatory practices that have the potential to limit women's participation in politics, administration, access and control over resources like land appears inevitable. The participation of women to influence the process and structures of governance is still very much limited. Designing a policy that addresses all gender equality issues, however, is not going to be a sprint. It requires a long-term plan and strategy encompassing all dimensions such as education, equal pay, and beyond. Strengthening federal governance and pluralism in Ethiopia, a project fully financed by the government of Canada is one of the governance programs of the Forum of Federations that is implemented since June 2017. It is designed to address weaknesses in Ethiopia's federal governance with the ultimate objective of ensuring a strengthened and more repre repre responsive federal system for Ethiopian men and women. The project has been contributing significantly on improving the country's intergovernmental relationships, intergovernmental fiscal relationships, and understanding the constitution. Thank you, Government of Canada and Forum of Federations for your extremely helpful contributions. We learned that ensuring gender equality occupies the central place in Forum of Federations, strategic directions, and it has recognized gender equality as a construct, uh, as constitutive element of federal governance that requires women and men have equal opportunities to participate in and influence the process and structure of governance. We understand Canada's feminist foreign policy, which is based on broader principles of inclusivity, being people-focused accessibility and collaboration. Being an active member of the forum forum and long-standing partner to the government of Canada. My government is also committed to promote gender equality in all aspects of life as reflected in the country's constitution, various laws, policies, as well as international obligations. Unlike many social and economic sectors, it has been difficult to clearly articulate, articulate the link between federal governance and gender. This report has significant and supports the process and structures of gender-responsive federal governance. It examines the complex dynamics of gender equality in federal countries, including Ethiopia, in selected areas, including rights protection, service delivery, violence against women, family relations, political representation and participation, economic empowerment. The report synthesizes the key theoretical and empirical learnings from the existing evidence. It can serve as a basis for enriching the approach of the forum of federations and other government and non-governmental organizations to supporting and facilitating initiatives to advance gender equality the rights of, and the rights of women. It can serve as reference for policy reviews and social, economic, and political and legal reform programs. On behalf of my government and on my, on my own behalf, I would like to congratulate Professor Christine Posters, 
postdoctoral post from law faculty at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia for her diligent and excellent piece of work. I would also like to thank and congratulate the Forum of Federations to commission this work in organizing its launching webinar. Happy 20th anniversary and wish you many more successful years ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minister Fitzum. Uh, I'm going to now uh, move slightly to the unscripted part of the, uh, of the event. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'll, I'll start by asking Minister Gould a little bit to draw on your own experience as a politician uh, to, to, te to tell us in your view uh, the best way that policymakers can leverage and maximize opportunities that federal and decentralized systems might provide for advancing gender equality and what you think might are some of the uh, obstacles and how they might be overcome. Certainly. Um, but before that, I, I also want to wish uh, Minister Fitzsimmons a happy birthday. Uh, I couldn't think of a better way to spend my birthday than talking about gender and governance, right? This is, this is perfect. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's very interesting that you asked that question because I think, um, you know, when I think about my own experience as a politician in Canada, um, many of the things that I would like to do to advance gender equality um, often lie at the provincial level. Um, so, you know, if you think about one of the key things that we know advances gender equality is access to affordable quality, um, accessible childcare. And in the Canadian uh, Federation, ch delivery of childcare is a provincial responsibility. And so there is a very uneven, as, uh, as Christine mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, uneven access to different government services depending on where you live within our federation. And so one of the things that we are looking to do now, um, and this is something that personally I've been working on um, since I was elected was, developing a national child care program. So we have, uh, you know, the, the Canada Health Act that, that ensures universal access to health care across the country. Of course, each province is responsible for the delivery and the implementation of that. But what I would like to see is something akin to that for child care uh, so that we can level the playing field. But, but those are some of the challenges um, when it comes to federalism is different access depending on sub-jurisdictions uh, decisions um, in terms of how they're going to provide access to those services. However, when you have intentional and dedicated leadership at the federal level uh, that is committed to gender equality, that is committed to ensuring women are in leadership positions, um, and it's not just a token, it's a, it's a meaningful leadership position, then you can actually work to advance um, you know, and utilize the opportunities and the tools that federalism has, uh, broader gender equality initiatives. And so that's, you know, one example. Um, in terms of what we're doing internationally, we're working with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to support, um, you know, women's participation in municipal governance uh, right around the world, particularly in the Middle East, Africa, um, Southeast Asia, and um, in, in the Americas. Um, and really working to build uh, networks of female parliamentarians and female political leaders and activists to support each other. Um, so, you know, there's the importance of having intentional, uh, meaningful leadership from the top that is going to ensure that women have positions of power and they actually can exert um, influence and, and fulfill those roles. But then we also need to work um, at, the, at the more grassroots um, you know, parliamentarian level uh, to make sure that women have um, the networks that they need to be able to advance uh, the issues that they're working on. Because, you know, uh, at least here in Canada, we still haven't really cracked the 30% of female parliamentarians. So even though we have um, a gender balanced cabinet, when it comes to parliamentarians, we still, and, and you know, the gender balanced cabinet means we're advancing these issues. But, you know, in many uh, local governments, uh, you know, sub-regional governance, federal governments, we still need to be there in solidarity with women leaders right around the world. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Mr. Fitzum, over to you, same, same question. Yeah, uh, excellent question. Uh, I really want to look at uh, this question, uh, you know, uh, on three levels, like such 
uh, issues uh, of uh, addressing, you know, uh, gender equality uh, can be addressed, especially in Ethiopian context, uh, in, for instance, at individual uh, perception, uh, you know, attitudes and practices, uh, in institutional and uh, social cultural as well. Uh, some of the measures that uh, the government can really take, and uh, in fact, uh, is trying to. Uh, work on at the moment uh, include and may include promote women's rights, uh, safety and participation, uh, which uh, includes intensive awareness creation campaigns, especially in countries like Ethiopia, where you know uh, gender roles are clearly uh, you know uh, narrated and crafted uh, in such a way uh, that you know some roles are given. Uh, to only men and some are uh, to uh, women. So we really need that awareness creation, intensive awareness creation campaigns and uh, promotions and advocacy works. Uh, the other one is ensure active participation in decision making. Uh, again, as I've said earlier, uh, there are, for instance, some uh, big influential portfolios which uh, uh, used to be saved for only men uh, in all you know uh, levels of uh, leadership so uh, that should change and uh, such influential and uh, uh, you know uh, big portfolios uh, should also be uh, really given to women so that you know they influence so that they prove themselves that they can uh, the other one is continuous leadership development support trainings coaching experience sharing you know this all because as I mentioned earlier, awareness raising to others, as well as, you know, in uh, such uh, societies like Ethiopia, uh, women themselves second guess, you know, their own abilities. So it really needs continuous coaching, continuous experience sharing and trainings. Uh, the other one is ensure political environment are free from discrimination and gender-based uh, uh, violence. Uh, you know, recognition, motivation, role modeling of women and decision-making capacity, change the institutional culture, rules, norms. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, I really want to uh, mention my experience when I joined uh, the office that I'm uh, working at the moment, uh, you know, holding political positions or uh, really um, bringing women to such big portfolios is one thing. But uh, we should also work, you know, the other bureaucratic positions uh, so that women also have, you know, uh, equal representation in those bureaucratic positions. You know, when I first met my management in my boardroom uh, from 21 directors, it was only one woman and that position naturally goes to a woman. It was a gender affairs director. Otherwise, all other uh, you know, departments were uh, led by men. Um, I've been trying hard you know, to bring that gender parity still. It's not easy, uh, but uh, it won't solve you know, uh, the problem uh, you know, if you only bring or give them that mystery portfolio to a woman you should also work to bring that parity at the bureaucratic level also. And that only helps the woman also to you know, deliver better in such environment. Uh, the other one is uh, equal, uh, you know, creating collaborative networks and experience sharing platforms for women globally, you know, at federal and at regional and local level that really helps. So uh, these are some of the things that uh, you know, governments can work on to address issues of uh, you know, women equality. Yeah. Thank you, Minister Fitzum. I mean, this is a conversation that could fill more than an hour, but I'm mindful that that you have uh, you have some hard constraints on your time. Um, so, I, you know, basically, what I'm hearing essentially is that institutions matter, but leadership matters as well. And it's not just about changing mindsets in politics, but also within administration. And uh, you know, we we are very fortunate here. We have uh, um, uh, Minister Hasna Ben Sliman, who is the minister for uh, for uh, for public administration in 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 Tunisia, 
And a lot of the work that the forum is actually doing in Tunisia with, with her ministry is very much uh, on, on these sorts of issues. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I wish we had a little more time to get, get into these issues in greater depth, uh, but being mindful of, mindful of the time, uh, I'm, I'm going to give the floor over to uh, our vice chair, Salma Siddiqui, uh, here in Canada, who is also in her own right uh, 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 an established entrepreneur and an advocate uh, for, for women's rights. And uh, not, not just that, she does a lot more uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing her, uh, I'm not doing her justice by, by, by keeping it uh, that narrowly focused. Uh, but Salma, if you would take the time, please, to uh, summarize and, uh, and wrap up the discussion for this morning. Thank you. Thank you and greetings. Um, we are all in different continents, so the same thing. Uh, on a lighter note, I noticed something and uh, it would be, it's interesting to note that we are four women with one man. So obviously the work is uh, that you have described uh, and, and it's in progress is succeeding. So um, what I would like to thank, like, first of all, we have acknowledged that this is the 20th year of forum and the forum is doing some extra uh, uh, ordinary work and great work. And thank you for acknowledging that. But we have to acknowledge our partner governments. Without their support, we could not have gone anywhere. So today we stand uh, where we are and hopefully continue uh, this important work uh, on gender equal uh, equality and the progress that needs to take place. Um, and what I have heard and it's very interesting. It's the same message uh, which the author has uh, very well crafted. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Foster. Dr. Uh, Minister Gould, um, uh, I will come to you because uh, later on because you're from my host country, but, um, and, and uh, you know, a big fan uh, on what you do. Uh, Minister uh, Fitzum, it's interesting to see uh, how Ethiopia is working and progressing uh, on the gender equality. The, the, the uh, incident that, or, or the meeting that you described, uh, there was one woman with so many men, you're lucky. I've seen men working on women's issues and telling us how to do things. So at least that was one woman. So now we are going to take over. I, as, as you can see from this panel or that we are four women and one man. So, uh, but again, uh, great work and the messaging is the same almost like what the author has uh, uh, described very well in this report and thank you. And um, what Minister Gould has said. And uh, again, like I would like to address uh, if I possibly can, uh, as I'm a proud Canadian, uh, the fact that what has happened on uh, in gender equality and the work they are doing, and, and it is all around circle and we all work together. We are a global community and uh, great work. So I would like to see next year when we have a similar, uh, not a similar webinar, but in person, uh, 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 you know, gathering, and Minister Gould has already accepted. So, because she nodded. So, <laughs> um, the chief of staff can note that that uh, you know this is taken. We'll come back to you with a date. Yeah, so, um, and we all look forward to having you. And I know the time has passed four minutes, and I, uh, everybody is ready to go. Thank you so much for for uh, joining and anybody who, who is joining, uh, it's great. Uh, I just need to give a shout out if I'm totally getting off to someone who, uh, who I admire is Monica Leroy, who's listening. And she's a great woman at uh, um, advocacy. So great. And thank you so much. And thank you for giving me this forum to be talking to such uh, talented younger woman than me but again, I'm, I can be doing anything that anyone want to do. So let's go, move on. Thank you. Have a great day. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you all.
once again, thank you everyone for joining us. And I just wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues, Liam Whittington, Diana Chebanova, John Light, and us, Maziribi, for putting this event together. Thank you. And, and we'll, we look forward to speaking to you uh, all again. Thank you, Minister Gould. Thank you, Minister Fitzum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.